Hello gardeners and thank you for joining us for Mid-American Gardener. This is the show where we talk about plants and we talk about plants that because you ask us questions. And so we're gonna hear from some folks on the phone lines as well as some emails and maybe a show and tell or two. We'll find out when the show progresses. So stay tuned with us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois. I mentioned a couple weeks ago that we have 40,000 new students on campus or at least 40,000, but I only teach 120. I wanted to make sure you knew that I didn't teach all. 40,000. But anyway, it's a great semester and we're having fun that way. So I'll answer questions about perennials and maybe cut flowers, but we have three experts here and we're going to find out what their expertise is, who they are, their expertise, and then they'll share some information from the viewers. Let's start first with you, Larry Shobe. Okay. I'm Larry Shobe. I'm uh, retired from uh, being the grounds gardener at Eastern Illinois University. And uh, I've grown just a little bit of everything of flowers, shrubs, trees, and vines. So I'll try to answer your questions this evening. Uh, our first question from a viewer is on privet hedge that they have cut back and it was quite tall and uh, they cut it back about four to six inches and as it comes up this summer it's a little bit uh, sparse but uh, they want it to grow in and fill in and so the best way to get that accomplished is to prune it, those branches that have started first because uh, generally they always, a few sprigs grow real fast and they'll continue to grow. But to get them to fill in, you've got to prune them along and then they'll fill in. So that's so about all you really have to worry So don't let the first spindly ones have all the fun. That's right. <laughs> so that's very good and eventually you'll get those mm -hmm. nice pruned it, hedges we saw right. on the camera they'll send up a lot more starts. Okay, thank you very much, Larry. And now on to you, Sandy Mason. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm Sandy Mason. I'm with the University of Illinois Extension. I'm a horticulture educator, and I handle just a little of everything. So whatever we can talk about tonight. Uh, I actually, I have an email question from John in Normal, Illinois. And, and first, I have to commend John for his imagination. Um, he has <laughs> these. Tw he has about 25 of these on a stem and leaves of water sprouts or suckers of our red bud tree tree and from the side they look like mini brontosauruses so he wants to know what they really are so I guess that looks like a mini brontosaurus I'm not sure but uh, anyway <laughs> good good call there John and really what we find is with a lot of uh, what are called suckers or even water sprouts uh, when they grow out very very quickly they often have huge leaves so it's very common so you really you are seeing these suckers coming up from the base of the red bud so it's still part of the red bud tree but because they're these suckers coming up they grow like crazy and often leaves are quite large so it's one of those things that generally people do go ahead and remove them you know cut them down as far as you can uh, and hopefully they don't grow back or maybe you enjoy brontosaurus and you just let them go I'm not sure I guess you could do that as well but you know so we see that in a lot of plants and so it's very very typical so it's not something super weird but but very creative but very creative part. brontosaurus I, I don't quite see the brontosaurus but hey in in real life maybe it does look like that. <laughs> 3D. 3D. Yeah, that's yeah. Oh, we got a flat picture. Which oh, water we'll give John the benefit of the doubt that With he really water did see sprouts, it. With water sprouts, though, they're so much easier to remove when they're just coming up. Take your hand and knock them off, and and you'll not have these terrible bumps on your plants. Be they versus trees, pruning shrubs. much right. later. Right. Yes. Right. 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 Very good point. Well, thank you too for that. And now David Robson. Thanks, Diane. You're next. I'm David Robson. I guess I'm the only one that's going to say I'm happening because we were told that you told <laughs> us we were happening. supposed to say that, the so maybe I'm them. not happening. <laughs> Anyhow, I am a horticulturalist and a pesticide specialist here on campus. Um, like Sandy, I'm a generalist at the same time, so I think between all four of us, we'll be able to answer just about any question. Um, my questions are a double question. One came in uh, June where somebody actually found leftover tulip bulbs in their basement and didn't know what to do with them. Could they still plant them or wait till fall? And the other one talked about wanting to get tulips to bloom early, but didn't really know the exact dates to figure out when the ideal time to plant tulips so you could get them to bloom at a specific time. Well, first of all, with the tulips that they found, um, squeeze them and if there's any weight or substance to that tulip, 
that you've had in the basement for a year and it feels solid, go ahead and plant it this fall. Guess what, David? I'm going to say that if you press that, that's just going to turn into dust and it's going to be paper. That's what and I that's think. And that's what happens with tulips. They just won't have uh, that longevity keeping power. Gladiolas might. I've had that happen with gladiolas, but with tulips and daffodils, mm. they just become uh, a former shell of themselves is essentially <laughs> what we can say. But don't you think that you need to plant it this year so it can make at least a small bulb for next year or not? Oh, I don't think there'll be anything that'll grow this year. I think if, if unless there's some if weight. There's some if, weight. If, if there's yeah. a weight to it, yes, right. you could go ahead and do that. But if it's not, no, throw it away. Compost pile. Compost right. pile. Mm -hmm. As far as planting tulips that you want to bloom in a specific time, it's almost impossible to plan that out just for the simple fact that some years the temperature warms up really early. I remember we've had tulips blooming at the end of March, 1st of April, mm -hmm. and other times into May. So it's all weather dependent, depends on how deep you plant them. And with tulips, there are 13 different types of tulips and there are some early, mid, and late, and depends if you want the singles, the doubles, the Darwins, the Rembrandts, and so forth. You want them all. You want them all. So Maybe. if you have the room, if you want them to bloom at a specific time, if you want them early, go for the early types. If you want them mid, go for the mid, the same. Uh, you're basically going to be looking at April to May as a bloom time, maybe from the 1st of April to the end of the May. Uh, under normal conditions, maybe mid-May. When they say plant them six to eight inches deep, plant them six to eight inches deep. You know, this is eight and a half inches right there. You know, there are a lot of people who will think that's eight inches. So um, you definitely want to get a ruler out there, or if you can get somebody will give you a bulb auger, use the bulb auger because they're a nice eight inches. That's the plug. Thank you, Diane, for You're that welcome. bulb auger. <laughs> That's what you have to do, and then keep your fingers crossed that it'll be a typical year where the forsythia start blooming right around the middle, the first to the middle of April. That means your tulips would probably bloom normal of what they should be, but again, it's all weather dependent. And most trowels, the blade of the trowel is six inches. Right. For most trowels. Now, I have a longer one that's eight, but you can measure that, and then you want to go at least that depth. Right. And it, it, helps if the so <laughs> it helps if the soil is nice and loose, and if right. it's hard, it gets harder to yes. dig that. Uh, for tulip planting, I go with a thinner, sh more pointed trowel to start, and then I end. Okay, so I have several kinds of trowels, but it is challenging. But that auger that you gave me, it, was, it, it really does. works. I think the right. deeper you plant them, the less they'll multiply so mm -hmm. quickly. Right. And that's true of daffodils also. However, the early tulips are three to four inch depth. Those little um, cough manny, the, cough manny, the I, water lily tulips, the species types. red riding yes. hoods. You want to plant those because they are gorgeous. Absolutely. All right. So we got carried away on tulips, <laughs> but it's the season getting close to planting Order tulip them now. Time. Yes, because it's a, the soil temperature is a little warm right now. Absolutely. But it's getting close. All right, well, let's go to some of your questions on the phone lines. We're going to start with line three, and it's about moving lilies. Hello there, line three. Hi, Dan. Hi. Um, I have a Kirkshead lily that has gone brown, but uh, and I know where it is, and I was just wondering, should I move it now or should I mark it and move it later this fall or should I wait till spring? Okay, so Larry's going for it. <laughs> I, I would say move it now because I agree. <laughs> uh, we've had a lot of rain and if it hasn't started to, to root, it will very quickly. And uh, if it's uh, got roots on it, just go ahead and put it back in the ground. I normally like to move mine uh, right after they finish dying down so that I know where they are and I put them back in the ground and that way I don't put them someplace and forget to plant them. And right. actually September is a great time to be mm -hmm. uh, yes. planting and replanting or transplanting a lot of perennials and certainly peonies and a lot of things. Are needed. So it's a good time to get out the trowel, right. the spade, whatever. And and start moving earlier in the month is better than later. Yeah, right, right, right. Don't it wait seems for root development. Right. Seems like. Okay, very good question and thank you for that. Now we're going to go to line six and it's a question about water grass. Hi there, line six. Hello. Yes, what's your question? Well, what, what can you do to kill water grass? Well, that's a good, simple question. I mean, mm -hmm. it was as brief question as possible. <laughs> I wish the answer would be as brief. <laughs> um, water grass can be 
I mean, by my count, maybe six different types of grasses, from the crab grasses to the goose grasses. To, um, I guess we may even say tall fescue could be growing in there. And I guess we're going to say any type of grass that really grows and overpowers your regular turf grass. I would say the crab grasses as the annuals and maybe the foxtails come in some close. Uh, but I could even say nut sedge might be mm -hmm. looking in there. It's and in most cases, you just have to keep that grass, the good grass, actively growing. Spot, I mean, determine if it's an annual or a perennial grass. That's mm -hmm. probably going to be your first step. If it's a perennial, um, you're either going to have to dig it out, you're going to have to choke it out, uh, not like this, but encourage the other grass to grow around it. If it's an annual grass, meaning that once we get a frost, it turns brown and dies, you're probably going to be either, again, trying to get your grass to grow and fill in that area or use a pre-emergence next year. But basically, once the grasses are up and growing, and at this time of the year, there's really no chemical that will spot just that water grass and not do damage to the other grass. Uh, you know, Roundup glyphosate as a spot treatment will work, but if it's already set seeds, then it's more than likely an annual and you're gonna have the problem next year. Probably your crabgrass preventers that you put down mm -hmm. in the spring, and then again, repeat them six weeks later probably your best bet. And, and really probably, so the bottom line is get it identified. Absolutely. And that's because water mm -hmm. grass, I've, I've seen, like oh, you said, mm -hmm. uh, people call water grass all kinds of different grasses. It's like so you have to get identified. So you can take it to your local extension office, the master gardeners or myself, or any extension educators would be glad to help you figure plant out clinic. what it is. The plant clinic as well, you buy plant clinic as well, is always good. So get it identified first, and then you can figure out then, okay, it's Absolutely. an annual, perennial, and then you can have a management you know, figured out from there. So that really works out great. So get it identified and then go from there. So it really is kind of one of those confusing things when people talk about water grass. So Nut so sedge is very difficult though. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. So it really kind of depends, certainly. I kind of avoided that on purpose. Oh, though. did you? Yeah, I'm that's sorry. A tough one. That's, that's a tough one. It's, it it's really yeah. not a grass and that's the problem. Okay. But yeah. wherever Digging. you are in the middle America, go to your closest extension office and Absolutely. make sure you know what it is. Because in a two-dimensional picture, it's not always the same. You can't always exactly right. identify it. Right. Well, thank you for that question, because that is a good question. Well, we're going to go to a dividing hosta question next on line five. Hello. Hello. Um, I have a beautiful bed of hostas, and I want to share them with friends. Is okay. this a good time to divide my hostas? That's question one. And question two, I have a friend in West Texas, and I want to give her some hostas. Do you think they'll live there? I'll <laughs> say no to the second I say, one I because because no I have friends in West Texas and I oh. went out there and they can they'll put them in pots but they won't put them yeah. in the ground. Okay. Oh. And so they're container grown, but many hostas can be grown in containers on patios. So the answer is actually yes. So yes, in they can be grown <laughs> in containers. Yeah, containers. But oh, I yeah. would suggest that if you want to leave your hostas where they are, take pieces out of them and don't take up the whole plant because you're gonna set it back as far as growing and take some areas around the edge where you won't ruin the shape of your right. plant. This one but, yeah. but sometimes they will start dying opinion. out in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, clearly. I, I always tell people divide hostas anytime it. the ground's not frozen. Yeah, yeah. I'd say go for it. They really, yeah. they, they really are pretty good. And once you start digging around, you will see those separate crowns. So sometimes you can just take an outside yeah. edge if you really want it to look. Otherwise, it, it does okay. tend to look a little sad for a little while. Yeah. But, but, but who cares? They'll get out of there. What the they year. tend to do <laughs> also, and we had a problem at the university the last couple of years. Uh, they get so thick that the buds in the wintertime are above the ground and the ground squirrels and maybe other squirrels are eating the centers out of them too. Mm -hmm. We had had that and voles would yeah. do that mm -hmm. some. I can see that. So yeah. when you see those buds are sticking up in the fall after the foliage has died down, put another coat of dirt on them and that'll protect them. Mm -hmm. And that'll keep them growing longer too. And it's good you said, you know, putting on soil because we don't really recommend mulch because of I, slugs. No, right. So because the soil is what You want you the manage. soil on top of that. Yep. Very good. Right in the center. And then of course in class, I always taught that you can, you divide them at the pointed bud stage if yes. early in the spring. 
but seriously, you can you yeah. can divide them and move time. them. Yeah, the and divide them if they're close thawed. to the sidewalk. Divide from the sidewalk side. Right. And okay. Well, there's 95 opinions, but they're all. <laughs> they're we important. could be lawyers. <laughs> we <Yeah>. could. <laughs> but hosses are pretty yeah. tough. But I would wait till it's not in the heat of the yeah, day. Uh, don't transplant them when they're wilted, probably. Either. And don't leave them out. And yes, get them right Back away to someone ground. and have them plant them. All right, well, thank you for that question. We enjoyed that one. And now let's go to a Redbud question on line four. Hello there. Hi, this is Eddie. And um, I uh, don't really have a question. Early on on the program, a John, somebody had sent a picture of Redbud and said something about looking like small brontosauruses. Yes. So I saw, and I think what he was talking about, were some black spiny leaf hoppers that were on the leaf. And uh, take another look at your leaves, and I think you'll see those. <laughs> oh, maybe. Maybe I just wasn't seeing it right. Well, these pictures are a little small. They're so much they bigger. Certainly could have been. Maybe little that. Now, see, them. that makes more sense. I'm glad you're paying attention, because I didn't <laughs> see it. That's interesting. But that makes Ready? more sense, because that would make more sense about Montessori, because I thought he was talking about the leaves. So Except maybe that's what Except leaf hoppers that have attacked, believe it or not, the, the red buds, and it makes it look like herbicide injury with mm -hmm. leaf hopper injury, hmm. they attack at night. They're nocturnal. So they so, wouldn't be in a photo. So they, a photo. Unless they were dead and posed like a miniature brontosaurus. Oh, um, maybe. But, ah, that makes more but sense. But if, if somebody has a red bud and it looks like there's herbicide injury with the edges of the leaves crinkled up and mm -hmm. kind of distorted, that's uh, There it is. Yeah, right there, there it is again. Where is it? It doesn't look like oh, potato leaf hopper. I thought that was just a piece of the leaf. It looks like a little miniature... Well, it looks like Tyrannosaurus, but I'm not good at. Oh, there we it need, is. Oh, there, we, that's a better picture. Yeah, we need I Phil because so Phil's very good better. with his dinosaur yeah, yeah. identification. It could very well be dinosaur identification. Yeah. It could very well be a leafhopper. Yeah, which would be rare because yeah, yeah. it is during the day for leafhoppers. Yeah, yeah, but I'm not sure that's yeah. necessarily the one that causes the damage. The, the that's damage. a different one. Right. Thing, I it think. Could be. Well, very good. Thank you so Betty, much. You Betty, you get an A. Maybe she because be the size picture great. we saw, we couldn't tell, but we right. couldn't see there. this picture. Yeah. Betty, that's good, excellent. Betty. Thank Way you for your comment. Now we understand. All right, that's great. Now let's go to one more uh, of the phone line calls on line seven, and it's about Tiger's Eye Lily. Hi there. Line seven. Hi, Diane. This is uh, Joe. And I've Hi, got Joe. a question about Tiger's Eye sumac, the little shrub tree. Oh, yes. Okay, what I was wanting to know is if anybody can tell me how to prune. I have pruned trees and shrubs for years and years, but this one's got me baffled. And this year it took off, and it's about seven to eight foot tall. It needs some control. Well, I'd say good luck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, because it is a sumac, and like a lot mm -hmm. of sumacs, it'll send up water, you know, suckers. it'll send up suckers mm -hmm. all over the place, um, and it kind of does that. So when you say you want to prune, I guess, are you trying to keep it small? Because it sounds like it's really the size that it wants to be. Yes, can I bring it back to four to six? I think he could cut out the tips of it. Yeah, I think it would. I think it'll still branch. It should right, probably it should go ahead branch, and, and yeah. branch out. But it probably is going to be one of those things you probably have to do every single year yeah. because mm -hmm. it really wants to be taller than that. But uh, it's still a shorter right. plant, but yeah, yes. Yeah, it is to be nice. But yeah, yeah, prune out the tips. Yeah. So just probably do. more in June if you wanted to keep it. Does it send up a lot of sprouts? Oh, yeah, it suckers well, like crazy. Then you could remove the tallest ones, and it'll s send up more shorter ones later in the, the mm -hmm. season. That's I'm another sure. possible. And you could do a combination. Right. But if you want to keep it down and you, you do some sprouts, then I would tr trim some of the some taller of ones just so they mm -hmm. don't get eight feet tall. And I might do it earlier in the season. I was thinking yeah, earlier, earlier than now. Maybe even right. when it's, yeah. But now, now that you're checking out and how to do it. And if you don't like pruning the, the tops out of taller ones, then uh, just take the tallest ones out and let new ones come up. And they'll come mm -hmm. up all season long, I think. And if you go by the one-third rule, you can prune out quite a few if they're water sprouting. Right quite a bit so yeah. anyway there you have it and you can do a combination see what you like the best and then in the next year try that but each year might be different we had so much water they may be taller this year yeah, than that's true some years okay let's do a couple emails just to mix it up and Larry I'm gonna go to you next. okay <laughs> we have one uh, that says that they've been uh, 
planting roses four years ago and they bloomed good at first but uh, the last couple years uh, two of the three have not bloomed and I think the reason for that is probably you need to look real close at the stems of those roses because I've seen a lot of stems that especially two years ago uh, and and then to a certain degree last year the stems were hurt by the real cold weather and you'll see blotches in those stems and though this says that they uh, look good I think if you look at them real close some of them have never sent out flower buds and it still probably has something to do with those stems not uh, having dead sections in them and the water isn't coming up to enough to produce the flower buds. Okay, thank you for that. And on to you, Sandy. Well, I actually have a question here from uh, Larry in Chicago and he wants to know about identifying this plant and then he wants to know, is it a weed? Well, we always have to remember a weed is just a plant out of place. So this plant actually is, uh, what I think what he's finding is, this is actually a Rose of Sharon, which is one of the shrubs and this is coming up. They reseed, I know they reseed like crazy in my yard. I think there's another picture that shows and Rose of Sharon, if you remember, this is uh, that hibiscus hibiscus, that perennial, you know, shrubby looking thing that has kind of a hibiscus looking flower on it and it reseeds like crazy. So if it's not where you want it, then it's a weed. It actually is one of those plants I'm really thinking seriously about removing because it reseeds all over the place and it's just a little bit too much. So we do have unfortunately some ornamentals that don't know their place, I guess, mm -hmm. and they tend to seed out everywhere. So I am really ready to get rid of it. And I know in some areas actually considered a weed, it really truly a weed in some areas because of that. So There is, however, a group of uh, rows of Sharons that are double flowered and a good many of them do not produce seeds. The seeds. I have both types mm -hmm. and uh, I keep the one under control that seeds and, and all the single ones actually seed, I think. But uh, as soon as it's done blooming, I cut all those seed. I trim mine back, and all those seeds come off the twigs. Yeah, yeah. taken off on the end. Yeah. You have to be on top of it. Yeah. That's because the, they bloom yeah. all season. Is well, the but the majority of so, yeah, mine right. don't seed simply yeah. because they're double and they're varieties yeah. that I so that's seldom an idea. ever find one coming up. Okay, well that's pretty fun. Now we've got an ID. Well, it's, it's not really an ID. It's uh, somebody's concerned about galls from a huge maple trees, and uh, they're worried about that the galls are different colors on the leaf. And then the big question is, can they affect my garden of tomatoes, peppers, and Brussels sprouts? And so they don't. They pick them up. They throw them away as soon as they fall off the trees. Well, these are maple bladder galls. They're on silver maples. Uh, you can get hackberry galls, you can get oak leaf galls, you can get twig galls on bald cypress. A lot of plants get galls, which are just uh, a growth of the plant. And that's what you have to realize, and that's why you can't basically pop them off. Usually caused by a midge, a fly, or a wasp in the spring as that leaf is unfurling. By the time you see the gall, not a thing you can do. And in most cases, the insect has already left that gall. We always talk about sanitation, raking those uh, leaves up just to be on the safe side. But more than likely, it's just going to be an appearance uh, than anything else. While they're different colors, just happens to deal with the chlorophyll and the anthocyanins and the mm -hmm. xanthophylls and what am I missing? Carotin carotenoids mm -hmm. in the leaf at that point. Um, again, it's an aesthetic problem. Don't worry about it. Okay. So those are galls on maples and don't have an effect with the vegetable garden. Well, right now I would like to go to the mag quiz. Which color of tomatoes has the lowest acid content? A, red, B, yellow, C, orange, D, none of the above. D, none of the above. Despite the belief, all three have the same acid content and are equally safe to can. Okay, we just have a short little time, but I wanted to, while Larry's here and we can all jump in, just a little bit of hint on crepe myrtle winter care. 
and we've just got about a half a minute, what would you say is a good thing for winter care of crepe myrtle? Probably this far north uh, to mulch them some. In Charleston, we don't have to, and in the mild winters, they come up real, real good. Uh, plant them deep. And, and they'll generally, regardless, come up the next year. You'll so seldom ever really lose them. Uh, certain colors uh, may not bloom as good the next year, but uh, on, uh, that's, that's the key to it. And they do uh, bloom on new wood, yeah. so if yeah. it dies it back, it doesn't matter if it dies back. It won't get uh, as tall as what you see. A lot of overcast right. colors, uh, ov I'm sorry, overcast days, uh, does not allow some colors to bloom. That's what I would say. Oh, that's very interesting. Full sun. Well, great. I wanted to get full that one in for best. one of our viewers. Thank you so much for watching, and I want to thank you three, and I hope you have a great week gardening. Goodbye.